Hey everybody, thanks for joining us for Heartway Online. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, find us on Instagram and Facebook as well so that you can get up to date information about all the things that are happening in the life of our spiritual community. Uh, if you're tuning in, we consider you to be family no matter where you are in the world. We uh, extend our love to you and we're grateful that you're with us. A lot of fun things happening in the life of Heartway. We've got uh, homeless feeding that's happening at the end of this month. We're working on a back to school drive. So I just want to say thank you to everybody that supports us financially. And I want to ask those of you who tune in and who have been impacted by what Heartway uh, is doing to consider giving. Heartwaychurch.com slash give. We're always looking for new recurring givers or even those who just want to give a one-time donation. It goes a long way to helping us continue to fulfill our mission of helping people discover themselves in God and transform the world through love. I uh, hope you enjoyed today's service. Gabby's going to lead us in some centering prayer and then Ryan has an incredible message for us. Thanks for being here. Hello, hello everyone. There we go. This is what my students do. I show up in yoga and there's like 20 students. I'm like, hello. And then the crickets. I'm like, y'all are so rude. You don't say hi back? Come on. I'm so happy to be here with you all today and see your beautiful faces. You know, I was thinking to myself, it's July, guys. Like, that's so wild. It was just, I, I think it was just January, like yesterday. And it had me sitting with myself and thinking about the prayers I had early in the year, the goals that I set, you know, what I wanted to manifest with God. And so often we're like chasing that goal, right? We're grinding, we're going, we're doing all the things we have to do that we kind of miss when it actually happens, when God actually blesses you with the prayers that you had and you have everything manifesting into your world, we kind of miss it because we're always going. So I wanted to bring to your attention today to maybe think about what were your prayers to God early on this year? What were you asking for? What was your soul craving? What goals did you set out? And as we do our centering prayer, I want you to really allow God to speak to you. Allow your heart to open so that you can really reflect on all that God has given you. You see, the problem is, is that we're human, so we always want more. Our minds always want more. And life happens, so we need more, right? But I want us to take time to reflect on all that God has already blessed us with and given us right, and filled us up with. So as we start our centering prayer, I want you to have a nice, tall spine. Allow the eyes to gently close. And let's keep our palms facing up so that we can leave them in a space to receive. And as you start to slow it all down with the eyes closed, Let's start to deepen our breath. Slowly inhaling nice and big. And gently exhaling. Again, slowly inhaling, filling yourself up. And then gently exhaling, release. Continue this breathing at your own pace and allow the mind to settle down. Let's let go of all that we experienced before we arrived. Let's let go of all the thoughts running through the mind and let's allow ourselves to connect with our breath. This breath that gives us life that connects us and brings us to this present moment. Let's connect with this energy now, opening ourselves up, open to receive all of God's love. And as we start to release a little bit more, allowing the shoulders to come down, unclenching the jaw, 
letting go of any tension that you might be holding. We start to welcome God's embrace. We recognize all the love that he gives us, all the guidance that we have received and continue to receive. Recognizing that we are divinely guided, always protected. God is not worried about your past. He's not worried about what you've done. He's already forgiven you for all that you've done and even all that you will do. You are blessed with his grace. Release the heaviness. Release the burdens that you hold. And welcome all the peace. Allow his love to ground you. Allow yourself to feel safe enough to let go just a little bit more. The more we release, the more we can receive. With the energy of gratitude, Allow yourself to feel all the joy, all the blessings that God has given you. Allow yourself to feel worthy of his blessings. Be grateful for yourself for all that you do. Take this time to really sit with yourself, to sit with God and connect with all that he has for you. Take a deep breath, slowly inhaling. And as you exhale, allow yourself to release just a little bit more. As we inhale, we fill ourselves up with all the love. And we exhale, let go any unserving energy, any doubts, any fear. And as we inhale one more time, nice and big, really fill yourself up with the power of the divine. And as you exhale, affirm all that you can do Affirm all that you are. Connect with the truth inside of yourself. You are loved. You are worthy. You are forgiven. There are no accidents. You are full of purpose. 
you are meant to be right where you are. Trust in yourself by continuing to trust in God. As you slowly start to bring your awareness back within, just take a quick moment. Notice how you're feeling. Notice how you're breathing. Allow this peace to stay with you, my friends. You may blink open the eyes whenever you are ready. May peace and love always be with you. Amen, my friends. How you guys doing this morning? Yeah, okay. See, that's why Gabby needed to do center of prayer. Y'all be asleep after I finish talking to y'all. Y'all just filled with the spirit of the Lord now, you know? Shoot. Can I pray with you guys really quick? Lord, we thank you for this day, for your love, for your mercy. I ask you that as I stand here again, that you would decrease me so that you might increase. You said in the scriptures that we have not because we ask not. And so Lord, I ask you that you would use this time as a conduit to free your people, to release their mental shackles I ask that emotions, that deeply embedded pains will be loosened during this time because you can do anything. And if you could make the rocks cry out, you can use these clay lips to bless your people. I love you and I thank you. Amen. So for those of you who saw the title of today's scripture, or today's teaching, The Psychology of Blasphemy. Don't that just have Ryan all over it? Just, you know I love my big syllable words, you know? <laughs> but you know, this term blasphemy, one of the things that I tend to resonate with very deeply, Danny and I, is we've had similar experiences as it relates to spirituality, religion, the church, you know, there was this growing up in the church, growing up in religion and all the things aligned with Christianity, but there was also this transition into a stage of having to stray away a little bit, having to question, having to reevaluate, but it didn't end up in us leaving. It ended up in us coming back and seeing with new eyes. And so one of the things that I love about the dynamic that Danny has established here at Harway is that we love to look at concepts that are so biblical and so deeply entrenched in the scriptures and bring new meaning to them. And blasphemy is one of those biblical terms. The way I like to imagine it is it is the disrespecting or the dishonoring of that which is holy. And so my question for you is, what thoughts or emotions arise in your mind and heart, if any, when I say the term, God damn it? What's coming up right now? Cringe. Is it blasphemous? Is it an offense to God to bring those two words together? Very likely. Perhaps it is. But I would like us to examine this a little further. Because firstly, let me go back to the actual Webster's term of uh, blasphemy. It's an act of dishonoring that which is holy but specifically in relation to God and God's name. The scriptures talk about this as well. Exodus 20 and seven. 
Did I not put that on? Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> you see, you be having me second guess myself, bro. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. That is insanely clear. I mean, <laughs> makes my question look rather asinine. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's totally blasphemy. It's the name of the Lord, that God in vain. Now, I'm not here to challenge that. What I would like for us to do is expand our understanding of what it means to take the name of the Lord in vain. Because the name of the Lord is far greater than a simple term. When it's saying the name of the Lord, the Lord is saying, I will not hold him guiltless that taketh my name in vain. What is the name of the Lord? Firstly, we have to understand that God is not his name. God is his title. When he says that I am the God of Abraham, the God of Moses, I am your God, that is his title. But the question becomes, what is his name? And that is also spoken in the scriptures. This is actually, <laughs> I can't with you, bro. <laughs> We're going to be in Exodus today. Exodus 3, 9 through 12. We're going to read all this together because it's going to be relevant. Now, first off, how many of you guys have heard the story of God appearing to Moses in the burning bush? Pretty much the most of us, right? Well, this is that. <laughs> now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that they mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, Ye shall serve God upon this mountain. You can flip to the next one. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forevermore, and this is my memorial unto all generations." God said, I am that I am. That is my name. That is my name forever. And this is my memorial unto all generations. Now, when we look at that, it's so interesting the way God answered Moses. Because Moses said, what will I tell them? Who, who will I, I identify as the one who brings me? What is your name, God? And he said, when you're asking me that, what you're really asking is, what is my identity? What is the truth of my being? And he answered him, I am that which is. I am the isness of all of reality, anything you can see within your perception, anything you touch, anywhere you go, it is the embodiment of my name. I have literally written my signature on anything in existence. Can you just stop and sit with that for a second? How will it change the way you engage people when you realize 
that whoever is in front of you is the embodiment of God. No, 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 no. <laughs> whoever is standing in front of you, regardless of their title, their identity is the embodiment of God. That the dirt beneath your feet, that's why, it's a, that's why in verse 5, God said to Moses, take off your shoes for the ground that you walk on is holy. He was saying, even the dirt beneath your feet is the body of Christ. Even the dirt beneath your feet is sacred. That's the reason behind this message. It's not to discuss the meaning of blasphemy. It's to help us realize what it is that God holds sacred. Because when we come to understand what it is that is sacred, it, we can understand how to walk in this world. And God is saying, if you can see it, it's sacred. If you can touch it, it's sacred. If you can feel it, it's sacred. Even if you don't know it's there, it's sacred. Because it's all me. And so when we realize that God's name is embedded in everything, it causes us to ask this question once more. What does it actually mean to take the Lord's name in vain? Referencing that scripture that we spoke earlier. What does it mean to commit blasphemy? And so today, I'd like to speak to you guys about the three great acts of blasphemy. The first of which, when we stop being curious about the humanness of other people, let's sit with that for a second. When we stop being curious about the humanness of other people, because you see, curiosity requires two things. In order to be curious about an entity, a thing, or a person, we need to first acknowledge our ignorance about it. Because if you don't acknowledge your ignorance, that means you're seeing it as a foregone conclusion. You already know what it is. So I don't need to be curious. The second thing it needs is you need to have interest in learning more about it. If you have no interest, if you don't care, if you don't have a desire to get more intimate with that person or that thing, you can't be curious. But when we lose curiosity, especially as it relates to people, we also lose the ability to engage them with humility. We cannot have humility in our interconnections, in our interpersonal dynamics, void of curiosity. But the big one is, when we lack curiosity, we lose interest in their humanness. Think about the humanness of a person. Our humanness, that is our core, that is what makes us unique. That is the realness of our experience. When it comes to psychology, the body of thought that I love most intimately, that I've talked to you guys about, is constructivism. Because it is founded on this fact, or this concept, that there is no such thing as an objective reality. Because all realities are subjective. That means until I walk in your shoes, I cannot know your reality. Because as a matter of fact, there's not a single one of us in here that can definitively agree that we both see the same color red. I could be with you for 100 years, and I will never know, as much as I know about you, I will never know that we see the same red. I will never know that music sounds the same to you because it is subjective. And so when we come to understand how powerful this is, that our humanness, the humanness of every individual person in this room, 
is a secret that God shares with you exclusively. Your unique experience is God whispering his love to you. He's writing you a story that no one else knows completely. And when you think about it that way, it helps us to realize that the humanness of another individual is holy. And when you lose curiosity for another person's humanness, you are denying the sacredness of them. And that is blasphemy. It's blasphemy because that, <laughs> that aspect of us, it's, it's one of a kind. It is unknowable unless you've lived it. You, you think about it, it's interesting because the, the scriptures start coming together. It starts making sense. It says that we were shaped in God's image. God is unknowable. Every single one of you is unknowable. Every one of us is a dynamic enigma. If you were to ask a physicist about the, the nature of consciousness, it would say it was a dynamic field of energy, information, and intelligence. <laughs> Why y'all laughing at me? Come. Got my, got my peanut gallery over here. <laughs> I love them. Those are my peoples, man. <laughs> but that's exactly what it is, a dynamic field of energy, information, and intelligence. That's exactly what you are. That's exactly the makeup of your body, your, your, your neuroscience. It is all that. But when we understand the holiness of this humanness, it now makes us question, what does it really mean when I judge people? What does it mean for me to judge your identity? Because what I'm really saying is, first off, <laughs> I see you as a foregone conclusion. Yeah, sure, God is great and God is amazing. and God made you too, but... <laughs> Uh. <laughs> you a limited vessel, you know what I mean? <laughs> and we have problems with this. I'm sitting up here talking about it, and I'm telling you, there are some people that would see these nice socks because I'd be judo kicking them in the face. You know what I'm saying? Like, there are people that I, my ego has a challenge with. Not judging them can be a challenge at times. Mind you, just as much of a challenge as it is not judge myself. But the thing we need to remember is judgment is a figment of the mind. Unless you're enlightened, which I'm not. I don't know about y'all, but <laughs> I'm, I'm not, you know, just not at all. Um, but unless you're enlightened, you're going to have that as a tendency. It comes naturally to you. But you can judge the behavior, but don't judge the person. Because the person is unknowable. So you're trying to categorize something that is out of your reach. That's the difference. You can acknowledge the behavior, you can address it, but know the person to be unknown. And simply, you know what, actually, I gotta share this. I gotta share this. One of the most transformative and humbling experiences in my life has been, I spent about, I wanna say over a year, year and a half, working with the most amazing drug treatment center in the world, United Recovery Project. I was working for them and as a result, I had the luxury, the honor, of getting to speak with addicts. People who've been through the lowest of the low experiences. I, met a man who told me, now mind you, when I'm talking to this guy, this guy's in a suit. He just finished giving like this uh, presentation or whatever. 
And I'm talking to him and he tells me that years prior, he was laying by a sewer shooting heroin. And he was wanting to get to the gas station to get some fresh water. But he decided, no, I need it now. And getting to talk to people in those types of situations, people who have literally watched themselves give up their dignity, give up their loyalty to their friends and their family in the lowest of places. And when I entered into that dynamic, that space, I was thinking, I really want to help these people. I want to help them. <laughs> Some people slapped some wisdom on me like I can't even imagine. I realized that these people had a sacredness to them, a wisdom to them, a, a, a love and awareness to them that I didn't have a clue of growing up in my suburban home. And I got to see all of the people that are judging these individuals, they're missing out on one of the biggest gifts of God. Because the nature of their experience, the holiness of their experience has embedded wisdom in them. And it is power. And they're able to take someone like me and feed into me. And so when I go work with a client, when I go speak to someone, when I go try to utilize an opportunity to bless somebody else, it is their wisdom that is imbuing my ability to do so. And I learned <laughs> I will never, ever allow judgment to stop me from seeing the power of a person or a group of people ever again. I can judge the behavior. I may not even like the person. Facts. But I'm not going to let my judgment limit my awareness of what they are. The second great act of blasphemy. Got another big word. Hey. Hey. <laughs> when we commit idolatry with our ideas, most of us are familiar with the term idolatry. It is the worship of idols. You know, this is something that is referenced again um, in Exodus, Exodus 20 and 3. Thou shalt not worship any other gods before me. It's such a clear statement. It's saying, don't commit idol idolatry. If there is something that you value, if there's something in the world, whether it's money, whether it's power, do not put that thing before me. Now the question becomes, so what does it mean to commit idolatry with our ideas? We are so identified with our mind activity. So much of, so many of us don't realize the extent to which our attachment to our mind activity rules our life. So many of us don't realize that our emotion is a literal means of intelligence that can bring you insights about the world that trumps anything your brain can do, that anything your thoughts can do. You can feel your way through life. You can intuit your way through life. And obviously, yeah, we're still going to think. We're still going to use our minds. But the fact that most of us don't even realize that as a possibility because our mental activity is so all-encompassing. You ever heard the philosophers quote, I think, therefore I am? That's a big statement right there. I am, therefore I can think. <laughs> or not. That's the way it should be. But because of the fact that we have this immense attachment to our mind activity, it causes us to become infatuated with concepts. These concepts that our mind produces, we hold them like our children. We, we get so obsessed with them because when these concepts intertwine with our values and our beliefs, 
when these concepts start to attach to things that we see as important or meaningful to us, then it awakens our emotion. And now when we get emotion, when we get emotional about a concept, now we start to take action. And this formula right here is the same algorithm that has caused ideas to kill millions of people. There have been wars of people waged over ideas. Think about that. A thought, something that doesn't exist, can make people arm up with guns and bombs and weapons and go and kill millions of other people. Something that doesn't even exist. The mistake we make when we do that is that we're prioritizing concepts over people. And understand that when you make something more important than life, you are inadvertently making it a god. What is the god that you are worshiping over God? What is the God that you are worshiping over life, over people? How do you find that out? Where are the relationships, where are the humans coming in second in your mind? Okay, I got a story. This is a story about a woman named Chloe. It's a sad story, but it's a relevant one. Chloe was, at the time that she wrote this, was 25 weeks pregnant. At 23 weeks pregnant, she found out that her baby would no longer be able to survive and come to term. Based upon her talks with her doctor, based upon the fact that her baby was literally suffering because this baby girl was having seizures daily, she said, okay, it's time to terminate this pregnancy. And with a heavy heart, the doctor said, okay, I'm going to set up your induction. Well, that Friday, the ruling hit. And as a result, that woman was informed that she would no longer be able to terminate the pregnancy. And she would have to wait until the baby died naturally. Now mind you, I said that she wrote this at 25 weeks pregnant. She found this out at 23. So by the time she had written this, she had experienced two weeks of literally feeling her baby daughter have seizures within her womb. And something that happened in Washington was making her suffer this horrible reality. There is no greater human love than that of a mother. And she had to feel that. Now there's a reason why I'm saying this to you. There's a reason why I need to say this to you. Because how is that even fathomable? That we can make a decision that could cause just one young woman to go through that torture of having to experience her baby inside her womb, have seizures every day until she dies. We can do that because we commit idolatry with our concepts. We will allow a concept to rule over people. And if there is any paradigm for how we should act in these types of scenarios, it's Jesus. Jesus healed on the Sabbath, as you know, but what a lot of people don't know is what he said when the Pharisees came to him. They were waiting for him. They said, how could you do this? This is the Sabbath. You cannot be healing this man. And by the way, the man he was healing had had that ailment for 38 years. 
And so instead of them rejoicing over this man who had been healed after 38 years of being sick, they were more concerned that he got healed on a Sunday. And Jesus said to him, he said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And so this isn't an opportunity to talk about politics. This isn't an opportunity to talk about anything other than God and truth. But the question becomes, if there's anyone in here that is upset that I brought up that story, why are you more upset that I addressed something that you may feel differently about, as opposed to the fact that I just addressed a woman's suffering? That's the core. That's the core. I don't give a crap what you feel. I don't give a crap what your perceptions are, what your beliefs are. Can you love people? God said that heaven rejoices over one. Over one life, over one soul. Can you feel compassion over one? So much so that it eclipses your beliefs and your ideas. That's what this is about. If we really want to understand the nature of blasphemy, the nature of dishonoring God, we got to find the places in our lives and our hearts where love has not entered, where love does not reign dominion. Because we talk about love reigning dominion over this world. You're never going to see it until we start to have love reign dominion over us. I can't change this world, but you know what I can do? I can be a little more loving. I can be a little more loving. I can change my ways. That's enough. Because as much as I identify with my mind activity, as smart as I think I am, its power pales in comparison to the power I access in my heart. I love you guys. Got one more message for you. You guys got real quiet. Is anybody feeling uncomfortable in here? No, oh, you can tell me. Come on. We're going to shake it out. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> the third great act of blasphemy. When we deny our own Christ like divinity. Wow, that's huge. You ever thought about? Denying your own self-worth, denying your own value as blasphemy towards God? Hmm. We are human, but we are also divine. In the same way that we perceive Christ as the paradigm of duality, all man and all God, while we continuously try to separate Christ from us, Oh, that's Jesus over there. Jesus could do that. I, I can't. I'm gonna, I want to try to be like Jesus, but Jesus is over there. Oh, that's the son of God. Every time we do that, Jesus is doing the opposite. He's like, hey, I'm the son of man. <laughs> hey, the same light that is in me is in you also. He's always speaking to us to show us that same duality in us exists. And it's so funny because we tend to not see those dualistic elements, the humanness of us and the divinity in us. We tend to not want to see both at the same time because our ego wants to be the best at something. So it either wants to be the lowest building in the city or the highest one. You ever met those people where it's like, they either feel like the lowest of the low, oh my goodness, I can't do anything. I'm just worthless, I'm terrible. But then the second something good happens, it is like, yeah, I was just kind of born this way. <laughs> uh, my excellence oozes off of my skin like silk. Like it's just, yo, know, there's no in between. <laughs> and so it stops us from really being able to lean into the fact that what does it really mean that we are divine? Scripture, Acts 17 and 28, is one of my favorite scriptures in the entire Bible. And it's so simple. 
It's saying it is in him that we live, we move, and we have our being. That is the most, in my opinion, that is one of the most radical scriptures that you could read. Because live, move, and be, bro, that's all I know how to do. Like, that's literally what I'm doing. If you catch Ryan on a Tuesday, that brother living, he moving, or he being. That's it. That's it. You know what I'm saying? It's going to fall in one of them three categories. I don't know what to tell you. And all three of those, it is in him within which those occur? That's radical. Because if we really internalize that, if we really accept that as truth, it means that there's actually no one else here but God. There's no one else here. Whatever we see, it's God is embedded in all of it. And so this is radical because if God's the only one here, that means even I'm made in God's image. That I have capabilities that I may be able to see for other people, but I have trouble seeing them for myself. You ever seen people that are so willing to pray for you and they're so willing to celebrate you in your victories and they speak the highest for you? but you don't ever see them act like that or pray like that for themselves? Are you one of those people? Why? Why is it that we would have such trouble acknowledging God in that way? For many of us, it's because our experiences were so painful or felt so negative that it has eclipsed our ability to have faith for us. It has eclipsed our ability to see ourselves as having real potential. Can you change the world? Does that sound outlandish? Can you be a movie star? Does that sound outlandish? Can you be a millionaire? Any idea or thought that you can see within other people, why can't you see that for you? Like, really? One of my favorite basketball players, as a matter of fact, my favorite basketball player, Derrick Rose, he has this legendary interview where he just had this amazing game. And they're talking to him, and he's saying, why can't I be the best in the league? Why can't I? Why? Why not? And every time I see that, it awakens a fire in me because he was tapped into something there. Because it's not about what you can do. But when you understand, do you know who made me? Listen, I know that I'm dust. I know I ain't nothing. I know I'm going to touch millions of lives. Ryan Howard will touch millions of lives. Bet that. But it ain't got nothing to do with this fool. It's because I know that the same God that's in you, the same God that's in those amazing singers, the same God that's in Danny, the same God that's in everybody we know that we look up to, that impress us, that amazes us, that same God is in me. So I'm willing to ask the Lord, why not me? Why can't I? And understand that if I'm unwilling to imagine that, that's something I got to audit in myself. Because it's not only that I'm seeing less of me, it's that I'm limiting the capacity of God. Because I'm saying, God, you can do everything you want, just not over here. Just not over here. Why? Because I'm too special. You ever thought about that? That some of the times when we're being most self-loathing is actually when we're being most arrogant? You could see God in everywhere else except yourself. That's arrogance. No, I know you can use me. It's not, it's not cocky to say, God, do big things through me. It takes humility to do that. Because you got to surrender into that. You can't walk up to God with your chest out. 
Use me, Lord. No, you got to take your shoes off for the ground that you walk on is holy and put your head down and say, Lord, in the same way that I've seen you move through the Apostle Paul, who was a killer, and you used him in such powerful ways, in the same way that you, moved, that you used Simon Peter, who was a cursing fisherman, and you made him the rock from which you built your church. Lord, use me. And I believe in you so much that you can even use me. Make some, that's, that's honestly, that's why I believe him in my life. Because it's almost a challenge. Lord, <laughs> use the dustiest dust for the craziest thing. <laughs> like, make it so that when I do that, they will know it ain't got nothing to do with me. They gonna look and be like, oh nah, that's that is God. That is God. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Why? Because God has always used fools. He's always used fools. And so guess what? I meet the requirement, baby. Let's go. <laughs> and so I want to leave you with this beautiful and powerful message. There's a spiritual teacher by the name of Muji. And he was being asked by an individual. They were doing this event, um, this very common event within their tradition called satsang. And there was some reporters there. And someone asked him, because there's a lot of pictures of uh, like the prior masters, so to speak. And Muji's master was a man by the name of Papaji. And there was this big image of Papaji. And this reporter deciding to be, you know, so reporter-ish, ask a pressing question. He said, Muji, what is your master's greatest teaching? And Muji looked at him and he said, I am my master's greatest teaching. And he said, it is not arrogance to speak that. It is humility. He's like, but there must be a conviction in your faith. If you really believe in the power of God, if you really believe in this truth that we speak about, that we pray to, that we invest our time and heart into getting more intimate with, if you really believe this, if it's internalized in you, you got to start walking in conviction. Your words and your beliefs and your actions are too separate. You got to start walking in the power of God. He was saying, I am not just the descendant of my master. He said, the truth my master speaks, I am that divinity. He speaks of the unifying divinity. He speaks of the truth that God is all there is. And he said, I am the standing representation of that. That is my master's greatest teaching. Do you have that much conviction over your faith? What was Jesus' greatest teaching? I am. I stand in it. I walk in it. Not my ego. Not Ryan, my identity, my truest identity is my master's greatest teaching. And if you can walk in that and acknowledge that that is not only true for you, but it is true for every other being that walks this earth. If you can acknowledge that life always takes dominion over ideas. If you can understand these powerful truths, you can avoid these great acts of blasphemy. Because again, it's not about that which is blasphemous. It's about understanding the truth of that which is sacred. Walk into this world. When you leave these doors, look around at the world and realize that it is all sacred. Thank you. We love you, Hartway. Thank you so much.
Have a great Sunday.